Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. On January 25th, 2019, the longest government shutdown in American history was put to an end. Now I'm pretty sure that government officials wish they could have had a do-over on the situation and come to a resolution without this embarrassment. The same could be said about officials on the field of Mercedes-Benz Stadium just five days earlier. In what has quickly become one of the most infamous no-calls in NFL history, Rams cornerback Nikel Roby Coleman was playing some old-school 1950s football with Saints wide receiver Tommy Lee Lewis. Many believe this missed call led to the Saints losing their chance at another Super Bowl appearance, leading many to cry for a rule change that will be implemented in this upcoming 100th season of the NFL. And it all revolves around instant replay. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step off for DeLorean, the date is September 15th, 2019, and we're in Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. The time is 421 p.m. local, which is Western Coastal Time. Yes, we are in the future because we have just witnessed Drew Brees. He just made an insane comeback against the L.A. Rams in a game that broke the record for most points in a game ever, which was previously held by the Washington Redskins and the New York Giants. When the Redskins crushed the Giants 72-41 to on November 27th, 1966. I'd say that was a, uh, yeah, that was a landslide and a lot of points that were thrown. But however, in this near future, the Saints just scored a touchdown on a Hail Mary toss from the 50-yard line to Michael Thomas with zero seconds remaining on the clock. And it was insane. The crowd's going wild. We're in L.A., remind you. That is not cool because the Saints just defeated them 64 to 63 with zero seconds on the clock. And the crowd is going bananas for the other way because they knew that there was, what's that? Yes, pass interference on the play. But that's something that we've dealt with in the past. Remember last year in the playoffs, earlier this year actually, the Saints were on the wrong end of a no-call pass interference. But this year, things are different. The play, there was no penalty called. There was no flag. It was clearly a touchdown is what it looked like. Now what's going on here? Now this is where I'm going to give you one of my grandpa's words of wisdom because he always says, if you got it coming, you're going to get it. Now the Saints, they asked for this because remember last year during the playoffs, that no call, sure, that sucked. But in the future, as of June 20th, 2019, the NFL Competition Committee decided in a unanimous vote to pass the interference calls to be reviewable. This is the first time we're ever going to be able to have pass interference calls be reviewable by instant replay. And it all stems from that championship game. And sure, it was a wild one, and it was crazy. But now the Saints are on the other end of the stick. What's going to happen? Like I said, this year, 2019, the 100th season of the NFL, we are able to have pass interference reviewed. Now, the NFL states that under two minutes, the replay official has to initiate this, just like it is, you know, has been for a while as far as other instant replays. Pass interference now can be reviewed. Like I said, not sure if this is good, not sure if it's bad. Saints are about to find out. Probably both, but here's a part of the statement from the NFL regarding this. Even under two minutes, all passing plays can be reviewed for pass interference. Any 
in quotes, Hail Mary play at the end of a half or game will be reviewed in replay consistent with the guidelines for officiating the play on the field. Whoo-wee, in this futuristic hypothetical situation where DeLorean, we're riding that into the sunset, we are talking about Michael Thomas just coming down with the Hail Mary game winning grab with this the most crazy game in NFL history. Like I said, the most points ever scored. But guess what? Just like pretty much every other Hail Mary play, Michael Thomas, he decided to push the defender so he'd get a chance to catch the ball. And it's going to get ruled as pass interference? Maybe? I don't know. How the hang do the refs decide to judge this one? Because like I said, on every Hail Mary pass, there's pretty much going to be some kind of pass interference going on. Well, they took it to the booth because this new rule, they decided they have to go forward with it. They have to review it. It was clear that he extended his arms and he pushed that defender out of the way. So sorry about your luck, Mike. Sorry about the Saints. You just lost. Because, well, you know, game can end on a penalty and such. So what they decided to do is they throw it at the 50-yard line and stuff. The guys are all tired. Drew Brees gets sacked. The Saints had it coming. They lost. Again, hypothetical situation. But this will become a reality at some point. But that begs the question. How did we ever get instant replay? How do we get to this point where we're, we're deciding games at the end of the game of whether a guy pushed off or not to decide if it's going to be even not just a game of which is a loss or a victory, but also the highest scoring game in the NFL? Well, in the NFL operations section over on the website, the author pointed out that this has been a point of contention basically since games were even first televised, you know, really regularly during the 1940s. On one end, you have these traditionalists who are like, hey, you put instant replay in here, it's going to mess with the purity of the game by removing the human error out of it. But then on the other side, you have what I guess we could call, we could call a modernist, and they felt like embracing the technology to enhance the game is the way to grow the game. So like most things, I say the answer is probably somewhere in the middle there. But regardless of the side, it's happened. It will continue to happen. And we have to try to figure out Well, how did this thing start? So let's take that DeLorean back. We're going to go back to the beginning of this whole thing. Back to December 7th, 1963. A game between Army and Navy. Yes, it's a college game. If that date remembers or recalls to you, December 7th, 1963, that's not too far after John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. So this was a game that was honoring him. So it was a big game. And a dude known as the inventor of instant replay, Tony Verna, had previously figured out a way to rewind the video to show a previous play live on air before the next snap. And in this game, it featured Heisman Trophy winner Roger Staubach. So Verna, he had to create this own method, though, because the technology for exactly what he was trying to do was not present yet. So big time in the history of the nation big time in the history of sports in the NFL. But it wasn't really totally implemented or, you know, accepted in the NFL for a little bit. You know, we got 13 years there, and we're going to take the DeLorean to November 15th, 1976, a Monday night game. This is a Monday night game between the Buffalo Bills and the Dallas Cowboys. Art McNally, the former director of NFL officiating, also known as the father of instant replay, decided, hey, I'm going to have an experiment. I'm going to try to see if this thing is even plausible before I kind of bring it up to some other dudes. By the way, I'll leave a link in the show notes to that episode that covered Art McNally's career and what he meant to the NFL. And uh, you can get to the show notes by your podcast player of choice or through heading to thefootballhistorydude.com. Again, go ahead and head to thefootballhistorydude.com. Also, while you're at it, I ask that you please subscribe for free to this show by mashing that little subscribe button on your podcast player of choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest off the press episodes each and every week. But let's get back to this experiment. All right, McNally. He wanted to simulate what it would be like for an instant replay to occur and how would it impact the game. Most specifically, how would it impact the length of the game? Would it cause any interruptions or disruptions to the fans? Because... At the end of the day, again, we've talked about this. What matters is the fans, the experience. They're the ones paying for you to have your salary, Art McNally, so you better make sure that they're happy. And even nowadays, I think it's a fair question. 
because many wonder if this new rule that's being implemented is going to increase the amount of downtime for the game. So we already have so many times of game stoppage, and there's really not anywhere close to a full hour of live action play. So Art McNally had to think about this from that perspective. In this game, the Monday night game between the Bills and the Cowboys, he sat up in the press box and he used a stopwatch and a video camera. And later in an article, Art recalled that, quote, if there was any question, we took a look at it. We asked the camera technicians to give us different angles. And what he did basically was he would start the clock, you know, on a stopwatch as soon as it stopped. He would look at all these plays, try to get the play right and decide, okay, that was wrong or that was a right call. And one play stuck out in his mind. McNally recalled this one time when there was a missed call on a play involving O.J. Simpson. At that point in time, he said instant replay could have got that call right. He could have corrected it on the field. But at the time, it didn't. And in his mind, he knew right then and there that there was a place for instant replay in professional football. And McNally is all like, now we're tossing this firecracker on a bonfire. Let's try to figure it out and see what happens. So he threw it in. 1978 Hall of Fame game. Yep, the first preseason game of the year between the Philadelphia Eagles and the Miami Dolphins. Now, how many times are we going to talk about the Philadelphia Eagles being at the forefront and being involved in the quote-unquote first, you know, things in the NFL? But that's neither here nor there. This was a system that he was going to test for the first time actually during a game. And of course, it's not going to be anywhere near perfect because nothing is. It's a minimally viable product, but he had to start it so he could see if there was a chance that it would help the game out in the future. And one of the things that was a result, you know, the NFL operations site stated that the system's performance was lackluster. The technology was too costly to install in every stadium. The system needed more cameras than broadcasters used for games at the time, and calls remain inconclusive after lengthy reviews. It was clear instant replay was years away from being implemented at that time. To quote the uh, then-assistant supervisor of officials, Nick Scorich, after the not-so-hot first showing, he said, We still think we need a minimum of 12 cameras to get all the angles on every play. Electronically, I don't know if we're advanced yet. But you know what? Still not a bad first go-around. Like I said, many things are launched with an MVP, the minimally viable product. Because you got to throw it out there and you got to decide, well, is there any traction? Will we have an opportunity to be able to use this in the future? Do customers seem to have a liking to it? And they must have had something. Or at least somebody did because they continued to move forward with this as far as the NFL goes. They ended up testing this on six other preseason games that year with this kind of just, like I said, minimally viable product. But they decided at the time, (laughs) this is not ready for uh, regular season play. So later on, down the line, almost a decade, 1985 season, the NFL would test a revamped review system during eight preseason games. Things were starting to look up. A little bit better. We are on the right path. And at the time, NFL Director of Administration Joe Ryan was quoted as such. The thing we learned in the preseason is that we can get the logistical things done. That is, it's possible to review instant replays in the press box and get the word of the referee on the field without a significant loss of time. And that was a huge thing. Because like you said, if you're sitting there delaying and you're fumbling around, the announcers trying to figure out, well, what are we going to talk about? We can't keep saying the same thing over and over. And the fans, especially in the stadiums, that will cause an issue. But let's just say, the owners must have been somewhat impressed because they decided to have an unprecedented vote to implement that in the upcoming year's playoffs. Now, it was not voted in, they lost, but it was just a barely lost vote. Now think about it, not even in the regular season yet, so I can see why they'd have hesitation. Why would we implement this new thing on the bigger stage as far as playoffs go when we haven't even tested it during the regular season? But the Cleveland Browns, at the time, the owner, Art Modell, I think he was one of them that was on board. Because here's a quote from him. Owners didn't want a playoff game decided by a bad call, and so they tried to push it through right there. But that was a little too quick for some. And even though it might have been a little bit too quick for some, the next owners meeting in the offseason, the new system was pushed through with a 23-4-1 votes. They only needed 21 to pass, so they had two more votes than what were required. Still. At the beginning of the regular season in 1986, this was going to be a limited system. It was the first system that was going to be kind of, we call it official. 
Now, during this system, this first one, there were no coaches' challenges. Technology wasn't really there like, uh, you know, it is nowadays, not for the fans, and most initiated reviews would be from upstairs in the box. And here were reviewable plays in this first go-around. The first was plays of possession or touching, which basically meant fumbles, interceptions, receptions, muffs, or ineligible player touching forward pass. Also, it was the second one. Most plays governed by sidelines, goal lines, end lines, and line of scrimmage. So basically what we're talking about here is, you know, was it really a forward pass? Did the dude go out of bounds? Was that really a touchdown? And also, they would have the third, easily detectable infractions. Now, one infraction that they talked about was too many players on the field. Yeah, you can pause the tape. You can count. Yep, there's 12 dudes out there. Yep, throw the flag. Go back a few yards. But it was, like I said, limited. And although this landside vote, you know, as far as the majority, it was still much debate. The decision was to let it play out for a year, and then they're going to go ahead and vote on it the following season. And let's just take you back. This is kind of what it looked like for the first time. There were replay officials in a booth. They had two, I'm telling you, yeah, just two, nine-inch, That yeah, take your tape measure out, this nine-inch TV monitors with a broadcast feed and two VCRs. Now, for those of you that don't know what a VCR is, just go ahead and look it up. But that's what they were using. Technology was nowhere near what it is today. But they had to start somewhere. And even another thing that they implemented, because they were super worried about how would this impact the, you know, the delays in the game. The reviews were limited to a maximum of two minutes, basically starting from the time that the umpire signaled the timeout and all the way through to the time that they would make a, make a decision. Like I said, just two minutes. Now, you know today, with commercials and everything, that the TV, the the big old TV giants, they actually love instant replay because it gives them an excuse. Let's cut to a commercial more times and more often. But it didn't take long for a first instant replay because that first week, 1986 season, on the third snap of the game from scrimmage between the defending champions, Chicago Bears and the Cleveland Browns, That's how quick they got and they had to implement the first instant replay ever. So the first official regular season instant replay occurred on a fumbled snap. Browns player, now this is a fumbled snap by the Chicago Bears, that is, defending champions. The Browns player lands on it in the end zone, looked around, yeah, super happy, I got a touchdown, right? And But wait a second, looked like he might have been out of bounds when he caught that ball, you know, deciding to flop on it and everything. Instant replay, however, we've got this thing. Let's go take it. Put it to the tape. Let's take and see what's going on here. Instant replay confirmed that he was, in fact, inbounds, and that was the first ever instant replay used in regular season games. Bam, boom. Touchdown for you, Mr. Cleveland Brown. But although this clearly showed that there was an opportunity for instant replay to have a positive impact on games, there was one major controversy that year. Now, it doesn't mean that there was other controversies. There were definitely a bunch of controversies as far as is this real thing really working, but a major one came between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Oakland Raiders. Raiders quarterback Mark Wilson tossed the pass to Doki Williams in the corner of the end zone. On the field, it was ruled a touchdown. So yeah, yeah, spike that ball, get those points on the board, and let's go. So what did they do? They sent that up to the booth. They had to take a look at it. The instant replay official looks at it and is like, hey, <laughs> that's not a complete pass. That is not a touchdown. Incomplete. So he uses his little old school walkie talkie. He relays the message down to the umpire, but the umpire heard pass is complete instead of pass is incomplete because it's loud out there. You've got these walkie talkies. Yeah, that's what you're trying to use to communicate inside a stadium. We got a bunch of fans that are crazy, maybe drinking some beverages of choice and getting, getting all rowdy. Well, umpire John Keck, because he didn't hear this right, he ruled it a touchdown. And jokingly, after the game, the Raiders quarterback said, my buddy, the instant replay guy. But it proved that they needed to make sure that there were some kind of advancements to instant replay before we could really truly implement this full time. And one thing that did come out of it, though, positively, like I said, we got to change some things up. The technology would end up changing shifting to pagers and headsets using different terminology too that was clear like reversed or confirmed things like that that you clearly could not misconstrue but overall the first season with instant replay 
they used it a total of 374 times, which equated out to 1.6 reviews per game. And only 10% of those resulted in reversals of the ruling on the field. So they had to go into the next offseason, have another vote. This time, there weren't quite as many owners that were on board with it. This time, it was only a 21 to 7 vote. But like I said, remember, they needed 21 votes to pass. So barely by the hair of the chinny chin chin, they pass it and they move to the next season having another instant replay. But to make sure that this would continue to improve, there were a few tweaks, minor tweaks in the offseason. And part of this proposal included first that the NFL was required to hold training clinics for the new technology each offseason. Another I'm using this in air quotes, upgraded, was they gave the monitors an upgrade from 9 inches to 12 inches. I'm like, really? That's that's going to do a whole lot for you, huh? I mean, I remember back in the day with my cousin, we used to play Halo a lot, and these little, you know, these four-way split screens, you could try to get as many players as possible, and we'd be on this little 13-inch monitor, 13-inch screen, you know, nowadays, this this higher definition compared to what it was back then, and because he couldn't see a whole lot, so he's always basically squinting with his nose to the screen. I, I just can't imagine getting that good of a review on a 12-inch screen with old-school technology, but got to use what you got, so that's what they did. An instant replay would hold on for a few more years, but then in 1991, it was voted down by 17 owners. The belief system was a major reason for this was it delayed the games too many times. Also, it failed to get the call right too many times, so owners were like, get that thing out of here. But Commissioner Paul Tagliabue, he really pushed for it because he felt that there was still a use for it, not necessarily maybe a need, but a use for it to enhance the correctness and the style play of the game to maybe get get it so we get the plays right. And in 1996, a new system was approved for use in 10 preseason games. One reason why it was probably pushed was because this is now when the coaches would be able to challenge the rulings on the field, and the replay would also cover three categories of play, out of bounds, number of players on the field, and scoring plays. Now, each coach would get three plays per half where they could challenge it, but they would cost them a timeout for each review. Another change was the booth taken totally out of it. They would put a monitor on the field for the officials to be able to review it themselves, but they only gave them 90 seconds. Again. Not a lot, but they wanted to really make sure that they didn't impact the flow of the game too much. These changes proved to not be enough for the owners, at least, because they would vote that again down in 1997 season. The big time problem that they saw was they were losing timeouts. They didn't like that. So, again, before the 1999 season, the competition committee tweaked it just a little bit again to provide an updated proposal. This time, must have been because of these updates. The vote was 28 to 3 in favor of yes. This new proposed system had some ideas to fix some of those main criticisms from the old system. The first was there were too many delays. So you wanted to minimize the delays, giving basically cut the reviews from each half from three down to two. The coaches now, they would only be charged a timeout if they failed to get the review right. In the final two minutes of each half, the replay calls are going to come down from the booth, not, not the coach. Now, this is constantly changing and evolving throughout the years. Technology, like I said, has greatly improved, vastly improved since the beginning of the time when they decided to start instant replay. And nowadays, you can see them over on the field with their Surface Pros and Microsoft, I'm sure, paying some Muku bucks to be the exclusive provider of the Surface Pro. But technology, yeah. Let's just say it's way better than back in 1976 when the father of Instant Replay decided to start his own. Or, even taking it even further back, the inventor of Instant Replay, Tony Verna, back in 1963. So let's move forward, though. In 2004, there was the next milestone for changes. If successful for two challenges, a coach would get awarded a third challenge. Owners also extend the replay system for five years. Basically saying, hey, we don't have to vote on this thing every year. You've kind of proven it to us. Let's just go ahead and give you a five-year extension. Then in the 2007 owner meeting, a 30 to 2 in favor of making instant replay permanent. So, didn't hurt that the NFL, of course, made the switch to high-definition reviews for systems that year, which was the first in American sports. Officials could also freeze-frame images and have a five times better picture. 
like I said, going back to those old school days of playing Halo, 13 inch screen monitor, four way f- split, and that wasn't high def, uh, very challenging. But it would not be without a cost. They would install this new technology in every stadium at a cool three hundred thousand dollars per team. So heavy investment, yes. But they would decide that it was worth it. And they would also create more advances each year because working towards that perfect system. And one of these advancements with a huge impact on how we have instant replay today as well as a heavy investment was in 2014. They shifted to have a senior officiating staff members be inside the Arc Mitnally Game Day Central in the league's headquarters in New York City. They started to talk directly to the referee during the reviews so that you could have guys with eyes in the sky, senior officiating members, be able to look at all the different monitors and be able to give their opinion on what would happen. This would not only just help as far as each game goes, but it would improve the consistency across the league and decrease the impact of the review on the game because they can get this thing all queued up and get everything ready. So when the refs get there to the monitor, hey, well, now I can take a look at it. And I, I do think. That is kind of cool that they have the experts on the TV. You watch a game on Fox or CBS or whatever, and they always clip to the guys that have been in the field before, the old retired guys, and they're they're officials, and they're like, hey, I'm going to call this one a pass interference because of this nowadays. Well, we get to go ahead and look at what if it's pass interference now. We will come before, but that's a touchdown. That's not a touchdown. I don't know about you. I think it's kind of neat, so... We'll just carry on with this. In 2017 also, the competition committee voted for two additional changes. The first was that the final decision on all replay reviews would come from a designated senior member from the officiating department in the Art McNally Game Day Central, meaning that we have, again, we're moving towards extreme consistency because it's coming from just a few as opposed to many. Also, the referees would be able to review all replays on the wired Microsoft Surface tablets. Again, again, like I said, there's probably a lot of money. Overall, in the history of instant replay, something uh, of an event that really kind of helped cement why it's probably worth it, at least to many, was in Super Bowl 44, one of the most instant reversals of all time. This is a game between the Saints and the Colts. Drew Brees had just tossed a touchdown to Jeremy Shockey. They decide, though, that I'm going to go for two. On the field, they ruled the pass to Lance Moore as incomplete. Sean Payton throws that challenge flag over there, and it was overturned. It was stated that they believed that that momentum swung in the favor of the Saints, and then the Saints ended up winning that Super Bowl. But why are the Saints, why are they surrounded that by this whole topic? And I don't know, but it just happened to be what came up. And the Hall of Fame site states that there's an instant replay booth experience. So I say that, hey, if you're going over to the Hall of Fame, you should probably go check that thing out. But with that being said, here we are again, 2019, with yet another enhancement or detraction, if you will, depending on who you talk to of the instant replay system. Who knows if this will improve the experience for the fans or will it take away from the game? Many already wonder if this will make the game even longer. Now, will it take away the authenticity of the game experienced years ago? Either way, it's a little ironic that the next major change in instant replay could potentially make the game feel even further removed from what the founders envisioned will occur in the 100th season of the NFL. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Football History Dude and were able to gain some gridiron knowledge nuggets of how the instant replay system was transformed throughout the years. Do you have a moment to share regarding instant replay and how it either saved your team or made you want to bash your head up against a wall? Well, record your story and I'll play it on the show. You can head to myfootballmoment.com for ways to do so. Now next week we take a look at that game that I talked about that was the highest scoring game in the first 99 seasons of the NFL. Considering it's entirely possible that this rule change could advance the offenses even more in the 100th season of our precious league. But for now dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com 
for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today. Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.